The book of Jonah is one of the most misunderstood books in the entire Bible, and it's for two reasons. Number one is our own familiarity, so we think we already know what it says. And number two is that because it's come under attack by unbelievers, that can't be true, three days in a fish, um, we're too busy trying to defend the book to understand the book. So let's look at each of those. First, our own familiarity. Um, you look at books in the Bible, Ezekiel, uh, no idea. Obadiah, no. Jonah, oh yeah, I know that one. This prophet's supposed to go to Nineveh. He doesn't go, so he gets swallowed by a whale. And then he's like, oh, sorry God, okay, I'll go. And then he goes and they all get saved. Hooray! That is the version that we've heard in children's stories um, and in flannel graphs and Sunday school lessons and whatever else. <laughs> We've heard that story, and the problem is that's not the story of Jonah. If you actually read it in the Bible, it doesn't go that way if you read it carefully. But if you've got that in your mind, then when you're reading the Bible, you're sort of plugging everything the Bible says into that grid, which is the incorrect grid. So the actual story of Jonah from the Bible is this. First, let me say, you cannot tell the book in 30 seconds. It's already so streamlined, uh, streamlined down to its most essential parts. The job of the teacher is really to unpack it, not condense it even more. But since you've hopefully watched last week's video on chapter one, I'll try to give you a synopsis. This is the story of Jonah. God tells a prophet to go preach against a people that he, the prophet, hates, not fears, hates, and he feels superior to them. So he runs away on a ship, he runs away from God. So God sends a violent storm onto the sea, but he's stubborn and hard-hearted and refuses to submit to God. He wants to die rather than surrender. So God sends something even worse. He gets swallowed alive by a fish or whale. Yes, the Hebrew word could mean fish or whale. Uh, actually, maybe uh, even sea monster. Uh, but don't fixate on details like that. The point is the horror of being swallowed alive. Our familiarity with the story makes us blind to that horror. Now let's deal with the unbelievers' claims. Whatever they claim, is not important, has no bearing on understanding the story, but because some Christians try so hard to defend the Bible with scientific evidence, they're like, look, look at this article about a man getting swallowed by this huge thing and he survives. Apologetics is a whole separate point from what the author is trying to say. Apologetics is not the author's point. That's not why God appointed this great fish to swallow him. There is a reason. People are so busy trying to prove that it happened that they don't even know why it happened, which is what God is trying to communicate to us. Jonah was running from God. He didn't want to obey God. He wanted to run his own life. He wanted to be the captain of his own ship. Many of us have something that we don't want to let go of. In chapter 1, Jonah probably feels that he is outrunning God, like he's free from God. But it all catches up with him, and he goes down and down and down until he's swallowed alive. I don't think we realize how awful that would be. He goes into the belly of the beast. And it was not like Pinocchio, where there was plenty of room. Not at all. It was utterly dark. He was confined inside an organ, the stomach, crammed up against deteriorating fish and seaweed and the stomach wall. And what's amazing is that God takes Jonah's suffering, the result of his own sin, the beast, the vehicle of pain and death, and somehow turns it into a vehicle of rescue. That's the gospel. God takes the cross, an instrument of execution, torture, and death, and somehow turns it into an instrument of 
rescuing me from my guilt. But let's get back to Jonah while he's in there, trapped. The author is not just writing this because it's an interesting little story. He's writing this because Jonah is the perfect example for readers of themselves. The original readers would have been Jews facing the exile, either uh, leading up to the exile, or they were actually in it, or they had just come back and they were trying to process why God would have brought them through such a heinous experience. So Jonah is the perfect example of their own lives. Even Jeremiah describes the exile in those terms. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he has swallowed us like a sea monster. He has filled his belly with our precious things and then spewed us out. It's obviously the perfect metaphor for what they had gone through. But it's also the perfect example for us modern readers. <clears throat> we may not have been exiled or literally swallowed alive, trapped in the stomach of a beast, but many of us are trapped in suffering. We're trapped in grief, in, in guilt, trapped in a horrible situation. Some, like Jonah, it's our own fault. Others, like Joseph, you know, captured by his brothers, it's someone else's fault. Uh, for others of you, like the man born blind in John 9, um, there's no discernible reason why you're suffering. It's just horrible and you can see no reason why. So, if you're trapped in suffering, what do you do? If Jonah is the example of that, maybe we can learn something from watching him. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Notice in this prayer, which is actually a poem, notice that he says that he's in the realm of the dead. The word for that is Sheol, which means the grave or the realm of the dead. Uh, so other translations have, I cried out from the belly of Sheol. He's not physically in the underworld, but he's as good as dead. If only he swallows you and then goes to the bottom of the ocean, you're not going to make it. So poetically, he's already in Sheol. It's the ultimate low, the ultimate bad situation. So he cries out to God. His horrible situation has brought him to a place where God is his only hope. What else did he have? No one knows where he is. The sailors assume he's dead. He is utterly, utterly powerless to change his situation. Inside that fish at the bottom of the ocean, beginning to be digested, the agony and the hopelessness, he has nothing except God. So he cries out for help. And he says, you heard me. You listened to my cry. It's my own fault and I'm powerless to do anything, but you listened to my cry. One very important thing we can learn from this is that there is no sin, no foolishness, no catastrophe, that is beyond God's reach or beyond his ability to fix. That's the facts of the gospel. He brings people back to life. Verse 3, You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas. The currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Now, wait a minute. The sailors are the ones who hurled Jonah into the sea. Yes, they're the ones who physically did it, but God was behind it. Jonah sees God's hand at work even when he's caught by the consequences of his own sin. In this case, God is at work behind the scenes, but it's pretty obvious, at least to the sailors and to Jonah it was. Maybe if we were there, we'd be like, mm, this storm is just a coincidence. Uh, but to them, God's hand was obvious. But there are other stories where God's involvement is not so obvious. Think of Joseph down in the pit and being sold as a slave. His brothers sin, and maybe 
a touch of his own sin for being such an obnoxious brat. But my point is, God is at work in horrible situations for Joseph and for Jonah. And Jonah is in the worst possible situation. But he knows that God is at work and God can turn it all around. Verse 4, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. He's sad that he's been banished from God's presence. Think about that word banished. It means something like sent away or kicked out, locked outside, banished. Now wait a minute, Jonah. I thought you wanted to get away from God. Now all of a sudden you're saying, if only I could be in God's presence. Now you're longing for his presence. You can go your own way, but when you hit bottom, suddenly God's ways start looking pretty good. Sadly, though, it often takes extreme suffering to bring us to that point. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweeds wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. It's almost a contradiction. The earth barred me in forever, but you rescued me? So forever, permanent, unfixable problems, you brought up my life from the pit. God can fix the unfixable. It often takes irreversible disaster for us to realize that God is the only thing worth having. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Now that he surrendered to God and turned back to him in heart, though he's still powerless to move his body, now his eyes are opened and he remembers all God's goodness. Everything he has is a gift from God. The fact that he's still alive, the fact that he was ever born are gifts, undeserved gifts. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. This agonizing experience of being swallowed alive, this is actually God's grace. If you think that God's priority for you is to be safe and comfortable and happy, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, God loves me, so he wants me to be happy. Because he loves you, his priority for you is not to be happy, but to be shaped into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So he's going to use extreme means to do that shaping. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. He's talking about a song of thanksgiving. Think about that. His heart is thankful in verse 9. Verse 10, he's rescued, but his heart is thankful in verse 9 while he's still inside the beast. What does that mean about us while we're still in our suffering or our horrible situations? Well, none of the problems are fixed. Even if he had died in verse 10 instead of being rescued, and nobody ever heard this story, and nobody ever knew what became of him, even then, it would have been God's grace to let him repent and turn to God just before he died. It would have been much more than he deserved. But that's not God's personality. He loves to rescue his children, even when they only deserve his anger. His anger. 